That's from a group uh, deep in the heart of, wait for it, Canada. <laughs> I know you might have thought uh, this is a Brazilian group, but no, it's a Canadian group. And it's called the Samba Squad. This is titled Batuque, which happens also to be the name of their 1999 album. So I thought I would, uh, you know, give you incentive to get up and jiggle around and move around to the beat of the Brazilian bateria drums and percussion and uh, to get our program started today. We need a, a bit of energy today because it is Free Your Mind Friday. This is when we gather uh, to express our opinions and thoughts about any number of things that are bothering us, about which we feel a need to comment. But you know what? Uh, it's not just about having a one-sided conversation. It's about us putting something out there for people to consider and not being surprised if people react to what it is you say. So that's the whole point here. 888-874-4888 is the number to call to get this process started. And I like Free Your Mind Friday because it really is about you freeing your mind. It's about you offering an opinion about something that's bothering you or something with which you are taking issue, uh, an issue in the news or something that uh, we haven't considered before, an issue that you think warrants further discussion and debate. 888-874-4888 is the number to call. Henry from Chicago, we start out with you today. Hey, Trees, how's it going? Okay, how's by you? Oh, it is a zoo out here, and that's why I wanted to bring to the table. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I wanted to send a, uh, greetings out to you and the uh, PRN Lee Stories uh, listeners and audience. Uh, hopefully we all have a safe and wonderful, productive uh, weekend. But Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it local because uh, over the last couple of months, Chicago politics has changed dramatically. Uh, with the announcement a couple of months ago of Rahm Emanuel, uh, being, you know, not running again in the uh, February mayoral election, uh, to we got up to about 21 candidates running for mayor of Chicago now. Uh, I think uh, earlier this uh, week uh, was the last uh, data to file your signature. So, yeah, we, we got a total of 21 candidates running for mayor of Chicago. <laughs> No and, lack of leadership there. <laughs> yes, exactly. We have lots and, and lots of leaders. And now we have, uh, yesterday, the feds came in uh, and to cop <laughs> they went into the office of a one particular alderman, Ed Burke. Uh, now, uh, for those who are not familiar with him, Ed Burke is a longtime alderman in Chicago. Uh, he's been around since I think the late seventies. Um, and he's also, uh, one of the politicians, uh, along with, uh, Edward Vidoliak, who was the main opponents of Harold Washington, uh, Chicago's first black mayor. Uh, he was a uh, part of the 29 verse 21, uh, uh, until, uh, Mr. Harold Washington turned the screws on them in his, uh, second term. But, uh, yeah, he's been a long time, uh, aldermanic, uh, power in the city of Chicago. Now, what's interesting is I remember, uh, earlier this week, uh, uh, Chewy Garcia, who was, uh, the former candidate, well, he ran for mayor and lost to Rahm Emanuel. Uh, he's now a, uh, he's now a, uh, a U.S. congressman now. Uh, he took over, uh, oh, okay, I forgot that guy's name. Uh, but he's in, he's, he's in the house now. But he was, he was commenting for some reason on, uh, Ed Burke because he's supporting, 
uh, a candidate that's running in that in that uh, ward. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> the fans <laughs> confiscate all his stuff, and basically <laughs> now, <laughs> now <laughs> because you know the thing about it is Burke is Burke is is, is in, a, in an automatic district where the demographics have changed dramatically. It is now majority Latino in his district, so. Uh, you know, and then he's also a big, you know, he's also one of the big supporters of, of Mike Madigan. Uh, Mike Madigan is, uh, he is known around the, these parts of the, uh, in Illinois as the most powerfulest man in Illinois. Uh, he is the, he is the head of the Illinois Assembly here in Chicago, uh, well, in Illinois. But people are starting to think that it might be Chewy who's who's starting to take that mantle now because <laughs> he's getting a lot of support from a lot of political people uh, in this area. So, you know, I just wanted to update you on the chaos that's going on. And uh, <laughs> Yes, I've been reading about it. Uh, so the fact that his office was raided, um, what are they looking for? Are they looking for evidence of corruption, payoffs? What What are they looking for? What is the FBI looking for? Well, we we're not too sure. But here's the thing: now, 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 um, Burke is still a, a you know a practicing lawyer. The 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 feds didn't raid his legal office; they raided his automatic office. So, from my from 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 my standpoint, and from you know other people's standpoint who's paying attention to this, this might look like there might they might be going after more than just Ed Burke. This might be an uh, investigation into City Hall or something. It might lead to something like that. Wow! So Chicago takes one more turn at its old traditional style of politics. Is that it? Uh... I, I guess so, but you know the, the way I the way I'm looking at it because this is a very interesting time in Chicago now because it seems like the old guard is 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 crumbling, but at the same time there might be a rise of a new guard that that might be coming in. We're not saying is that it might be different or similar than the old guard, but it definitely looks like the old guard in Chicago is starting to crumble. So this might be an opportune time for the people to maybe, you know, maybe, maybe they can take advantage of the situation because, you know, like I said, the old guard is starting to crumble, but we have to, you know, this is the time you have to take, take it over because if they don't take this over now, whoever comes in and, and is the same as the old guard they're going to hold power just like the old guard for the next couple of decades. Hmm. Well, we'll keep looking at it. I, I, I thought it was very unusual, and you're right about the fact that they just popped up and conducted this raid. And we have no idea what it is they're looking for or what it is they're looking at. So we have to wait and see just a little bit. It wouldn't be too long before we get a clue as to what is up with Mr. Burke. So we'll see that. Thanks so much to get us, uh, for getting us started today. Marie from Baltimore, you're on the air. Good, good uh, morning or afternoon. You, Trish, I'm going to make this Hi. short. Um, I did call in the summer of 2017 on another radio station and uh, said that I said that uh, Trump should be impeached, and boy did I get a, uh, a response! The panel on the show they all just sighed. They didn't say anything, but they just sighed. From my remember, from what I can remember, that's all I have to say. You, Trish, and you have a good day today. <laughs> no, but uh, what is your view now? Is it that he still should be impeached? Yes. Has that changed? No, it hasn't changed. I think think he should be impeached. He's despicable uh, to the, I mean, to the world. I think, 
and um, he just doesn't have it. I mean, how can anybody say that he has uh, marbles or, or, well, intelligence in the head uh, when he parades around and says stupid stuff? That's all I have to say, uh, you, Trish. Okay, you have a thank good you so day. much for your call today. Thank you. 888-874-4888. You're listening to Lead Stories, and you're listening to... Uh, our weekly gathering. We gather weekly just to exchange opinions and ideas and to introduce uh, ideas that uh, we may want to explore uh, further. Uh, so everything is in play, but you are in charge. You take us where you want us to go. Maat from New York, you're on the air. Yes, uh, uh, greetings to the beloved community. Um, Thank you. Okay, I want to thank Harvey for a recent call where he uh, was talking and explaining about fractals. And another way to look that up um, is sacred geometry. And, of course, that deals with the um, pyramids and the measurements and the indications of those great structures also. Um, also... Um, want to say to David from Brooklyn, first of all, he needs to slow down when he gives the name of his book. Is it called Slaver Game no. or something? It's called huh? Playing Playing the Game. Oh, Playing the Game. Okay, and there might be more than one title, so when he calls in, uh, if he's agreeable, I think he should give his name and where it's uh, his fuller name and where it might be available and whether libraries also, um, whether that would be a good idea. But, you know, with David, I tell you, one day you ask everyone to give a prescription, and David was so on point in turn. I can't remember the details now, but I, I just wanted to say he was running down the points that were so crucial, and I agree with him, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time. I want to take some exception uh, recently, though, because it was really needed for those of us who were registered or could be registered voters to get out and, as, as Alan Nur, the journalist and activist, made his point, when you're going toward fascism, you sometimes have to be incremental. So there is going to be a difference when the January Congress comes back and will start, especially around Marie's concern, uh, to deal with just some of the, uh, as many of the abuses as, as possible. And it's funny about Marie's point because uh, I saw someone that was uh, talking about a book on um, one of the cable channels, and the name of his book was A Hundred Reasons to Impeach Tr Trump and One Not To, and the one not to is, is Pence. So that's, that's an interesting dilemma right there. But, you know, I think we can all feel my last point, more elated because with this latest bombshell in terms of Michael Cohen and this plea agreement around the Moscow project, I mean, you know, I heard uh, one of the legal analysts, Jeffrey Tubin, say, well, maybe this is the end of his presidency because the main point is not so much the project itself, but the fact that he lied about it and lied about it and lied about it. And right off, when you do that, you create a bribable set of circumstances that could at least in part explain his bizarre behavior in Helsinki and around Russia in general. I mean, he's in a ball of hot water right now. It's encouraging because the guy really needs to get his, his comeuppance. But, you know, we haven't yet come close to what really is the deal with Donald Trump. Um, these things are, whenever prosecutors... You know, they put these things out, they titillate the, the, the public, and we get hooked on the, you know, the 
drama and the intrigue. But really, when they present ideas like this to the public, um, it's always because there is something even worse that they're not yes, talking about. Absolutely. That's, so that's why it's encouraging and it's uplifting, drop. you know. It's uplifting because, you know, at some point, you know, it's like he's betting against the house. Never understood the casino business, according to the research and writings of David K. Johnson, you know, and uh, all of those businesses went down. So we need to be looking forward to all of it coming out. And the Democrats gaining 40 seats in the House is very key because they can open up some floodgates that we've been long, long awaiting. Well, thank you for your call, and thank you for your contribution. Jay from New York, how's by you? Good afternoon, Good afternoon you, Teresa, and how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Very good. Listen, you know, Ma'at was talking about 45. Let me, let me say this to you, Sister Ma'at. Orange 45 not going no place for the next two years. Orange 45 is going to basically continue to do what he's doing, and hopefully he don't have a nervous breakdown or a heart attack or something else. But as far as him being impeached out of office, that ain't going to happen because Pelosi... And Schumer and the rest of these weak Democrats are going to do nothing but investigations that will be nothing more than dog and pony shows. So if you think anything is really going to happen of substance, you got another thing coming, sis. And to the rest of y'all out there who think there's going to be some changes come January. Because Pelosi and Schumer and other Democrats are friends with 45. They do big business. And as long as big business is good, everything will move the way it's supposed to move forward. Nobody never talks about how rich Nancy Pelosi really is. How do you think she's able to do the things that she's able to do? Because of her ability to interact with both sides based on their financial gains and the support of their friends' financial gains. So what you need to be worried about is what's happening to the soybean farmers and some of the other people who are being destroyed by the tariffs that this clown does in place. So stop thinking about impeachment and figure out if you're really about being a member of the Democratic Party, putting your house in order and making it so you could maybe take over the presidency if the clown decides he don't want to run again or if he do run again. Wow. I don't know. Uh, I agree with you. We just have to wait and see. Because this is a very complicated matter. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, people continue to, you know, dissect as best we can what the situation is. But we really don't know for sure what it is exactly. We have an you know, idea. We have an idea that it involves corruption and so forth, but it, it will take a little bit more time before things begin to gel and we can you see uh, more clearly what the issue or issues might be. You know, you trees, as a master journalist that you are an investigative reporter, you know that there's more to what the media is putting out to this story. You and I both know that basically their journalism is on 
how much sensation they can make out of these accusations so that they could get ratings to get revenue. There ain't no real investigation, I believe, going on other than Bob Mueller and his team on the shenanigans that Donald Trump is involved with. Back in the day, you had reporters who, number one, would have never allowed him to get into this position, first of all, because of the type of exposés that would have been exposed about these things, because I believe a lot of people knew what was going on while it was happening, but they just didn't want to do it or say anything because of the clowns like Morning Joe, who were out there trying to make it seem like this was a good thing, then it was a bad thing, it's a joke, blah, blah, blah. Nobody was really doing investigating reporting and exposing them for the fraud that he is. So now you expect for them to come forward in the media and put forward some kind of truth? You got to be kidding me. I don't trust the media. I don't believe 90% of what they say in regards to this guy. I just want to wait and see to what information Mueller presents to the country. And then you got to remember this. There's no telling if his report will be given out to the public based on the guy that's in charge of, I think it's the Justice Department right now. So we don't know really in all honesty where this thing is going to go. But as long as they could keep it in the news, as long as they could keep people in a panic and they can make some money, they'll continue to lead this to the left, to the right, to the middle, to the back. Well, you make an excellent point, and uh, I've talked about it, um, but many people in media itself, um, they are concerned about what has become of media generally. What is it that they're doing? What is, what is it that they understand their purpose to be? Um, we have a, a, a disturbing crossover between uh, people who say they are reporters and then you see them acting almost like uh, PR people. So it's all in the mix, but we just need to sit tight a little bit and more will be revealed. And as more is revealed, we'll get a clearer picture of what it is we're looking at, because what we're looking at is a very serious issue uh, that that involves other issues as well. But you raise an excellent point about the role of media here. Thanks a lot for calling in today, Jay. Thank you for your contribution. Okay, Ron from Connecticut, you're on the air. Hey, Trees. How you doing? Okay, how are you? I'm okay. So uh, the, the week before last, a caller said something that... Um, Based on what they said, combined with what I know, I was going to call in and make a prediction about the president's health. And I couldn't get through. But just yesterday, on another PRN program, I heard somebody, I heard a man predict that the president was going to call in sick before the 2020 election. So the thing that I heard week before last, uh, a caller named Moki said something about uh, Diet Coke. You remember that? Yes. So uh, Moki was dismissed by the next caller, who was a very astute and erudite, uh, but he laughed it off. So combined with what I know, we're not just talking about the aspartame, Nutris, uh, the Nutrisweet, and how devastating it can be when you cook with it or heat it up, or if it gets heated up by accident, it turns to formaldehyde. But I happen to know that one 12-ounce can of cola, diet or regular, will put your pH balance into a severely negative zone for 30 days. That's one 12-ounce can. Takes you from your 7.6 or whatever it's supposed to be normally down into a very negative zone. And uh, things like cancer thrive in an acidic as well as uh, an anaerobic, you know, anti environment. 
So I'm thinking 12 to 15 cans, my dear. But this guy is going to be in to have a severe, he has a severe, severely negatively impacted pH. And I predict that the president's going to uh, get very ill and not be able to finish his term. Well, I don't know. Um, presumably, he's been doing this for quite a few years. And presumably, he has been given a, quote, clean bill of health, unquote, upon becoming president of the United States. But your point is well taken. How could a person so addicted to Diet Coke, as you say, he has about at least 10 cans a day of the stuff. And uh, apart from that, he, he uses it to chase down uh, the, the, uh, the, the burgers and the whatever else he eats. So he's not yeah. as, as really in a, a prime uh, health. He's not in prime health. But I don't cancer know. Cancer or heart attack. Take your choice. It's going to be cancer or heart attack before 2020. Okay. That's your prediction? Yep. A, I mean, serious, not health, a serious health problem before the 2020 election. He's going to die. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Let's Thank move you. on. Thank you. Uh, Harvey from Berkeley, you're on the air. Hello, ultra wonderful you trees. Hello. How you doing? Wonderful, Pretty Harvey. Good. Pretty good. Thanks. Well, as you know, General Motors announced that they're shutting five internal combustion engine automobile pl assembly plants next year and switching over to electric vehicles. And they plan to introduce 20 completely electric models by 2023. This truly is wonderful news for both us and Mother Nature. And I'd like to share some thoughts on why this change for the better is so important. But first of all, my heart goes out to the 14,000 workers who are losing their jobs. And I'd like oh. to see... I'd like to see uh, our more than compassionate President Trump use our tax dollars to retrain as many of these people as possible in jobs like helping to build a, uh, a renewable energy infrastructure that will be needed to power America's electric vehicle revolution. And I'd also like to see uh, the Trump administration initiate a guaranteed national income program as a safety net for Americans, especially our, our workers, as factories become more and more automated. And uh, you might ask, where is this money going to come to re-educate the, the workers and the National Guaranteed Program? Well, it turns out that defending oil supplies, including everything from guaranteed uh, guarding shipping lanes to maintaining troop uh, commitments in key oil-producing nations, costs our military more than $81 billion, that's with a B, dollars in 2017. That's $81 billion that comes out of our, ta of our taxes to protect the oil company profits. And uh, if we switch over to electric vehicles, we can re reduce our need to protect foreign oil producers and use a lot of the same tax dollars to uh, retrain American workers as well as financing a guaranteed national income program. And as General, General Motors switches to electric vehicles, it'll be a global game changer because virtually all of the world's uh, car companies are, have, have to follow GM's transition or get left in the dust. And in 2017, approximately 143 billion, again, billion with a B, gallons of gasoline were used by internal combustion engine vehicles in the United States. And as our need for petroleum is reduced, oil company stocks and bonds will lose their, a lot of their value. And New York State, amongst other states, have already um, divested its uh, policemen and firemen pension fund from fossil fuels, to, and they're reinvesting in new, renewable energy. Um, and the reason that President Trump and his administration, a wholly owned subsidiary of the fossil fuel industry, are freaking out about GM's switch over to electric vehicles is not because of job losses. It's really because the fossil fuel industry is their power base. And as American needs, as American need for gasoline and di diesel is dramatically reduced, so will the fossil fuel industry's death grip on our planet, which Trump and his buddies fear. For example, 
when Trump got into office, he chose Rex Tillerson, who was the chairman of and chief executive of Exxon for the post of United States Secretary of State. And Tillerson wrote a book called Arctic Potential, Realizing the Promise of U.S. Arctic Oil and Gas Reserves. So you can see where they're at. And as we switch over to electric vehicles, thanks to Tesla and now General Motors leading the way, there'll be a lot less air pollution and smog. That's so unhealthy to breathe, and cities like Los Angeles will at last have clean air. What a blessing. This means less illness and respiratory problems for us and our children. And this morning, Gary Knoll talked about the dangers of our heating up uh, Mother Earth and the, ca- and the catastrophic effects of global baking due to our over-the-top use of fossil fuels like the burning of petroleum into the atmosphere. The cost of fossil fuel catastrophes in 2017 was a record $306 billion, with a B, dollars, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And once again, we are footing the bill for these climate catastrophes with our tax dollars, personal losses, and higher insurance rates. So switching over to electric vehicles will, electric vehicles will more than help us to lower Mother Earth's fever and uh, while helping to, to slow cl- our climate's headlong rush towards a runaway greenhouse effect that killed the planet Venus. And by switching to electric vehicles, trucks, and buses, we will accelerate our move to a solar electric infrastructure. And I say it's time to get so- star-powered. Let's get solar. Okay. Well, that was a wonderful little mini lecture there but you crammed into it you managed to cram as usual a whole bunch of facts that we need to consider thanks so much harvey for your call today thank you Eugene. from from georgia donald you're on the air what are you going to tell us about well I, i'm a little upset and i i don't think i should be but you can might help me with this yesterday <laughs> you're upset and i should be able to help you with your but upset i'm upset you, too you 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 more level headed in your thinking than I. Yesterday I, I saw that CNN fired uh, Mark, Mark uh, what's his name Mark Hall or something like that for uh, for supporting the Palestinians in his speech yesterday at the UN. Yes. And, yes. And that really bothers me. That I mean that me I mean where are the where are the civil rights leaders? Why aren't they out there raising hell? You know, they they do it by everything else. You know, they talk about how racist Trump is, this, that, and other. But CNN is just as racist. The liberals are just as racist. The only thing is Trump is more honest. And and I'm I'm getting tired. I'm I'm really getting sick and tired of these black leaders getting the pass on everything that's in, by by not doing everything that's important to us as a people. John Lewis to go and take a kneel. With uh, for gay rights uh, on, uh, at the house, the house. Um, I mean, these Negroes that do everything for everybody else, but when it comes to us, that they, they they don't have no. I don't know. I'm I'm just upset. It, it really bothers me. All I right, wrote, but, but I take, take a, a breather here for a minute, and let's quickly reassemble because you're you're discussing something, and I'd like you to. Help us understand from your perspective what is the issue, and why is it so concerning to you? Well, the, the, the issue to me is like when it comes to people, certain people, we're still slaves. We we, we don't want to. Uh, we don't have any power. We don't try to get power. We just want to get along. And to me, that's a slave. Uh, like I said, Maxine Waters and all the rest of them were talking about impeach 45, impeach 45. I mean, that's okay. That's that's a safe area, era, area. But when it comes to our rights, fighting for any of our rights, they're very hesitant, very hesitant. Yes, but, but you still haven't told us what the issue is. What is the central issue here? I guess The central guess. issue, I'll help out here, is that CNN fired, uh, well, he's a correspondent uh, to the show, uh, Mark Lamont Hill, right. who, who regularly appears as an analyst and a contributor. He's an African-American. He is 
really not so much a reporter as much as he is an academician. He is uh, he's really an intellectual, a young guy, new wave of intellectuals, but he's able to uh, translate a lot of complex issues into uh, language that regular people could understand. He appeared at the UN yesterday as part of a global conference and uh, he made some remarks essentially criticizing Israel for impeding the rights of Palestinians to equal rights and that's really really what uh, his point was and he made a plea to have the world encourage a discussion about Palestinian rights and to work toward restoring and protecting Palestinian rights. This was seen as uh, objectionable by CNN's management and he was fired. Okay. So in your mind, what is the question? In my mind, the, the question to me is, why do black people allow themselves, what, look at it this, this way, if it had been on the topic of anything else, if it had been anybody else that would have fired another black person, you see Al Sharpton and everybody else in the street watching, no justice, no peace, we're going to boycott this, that, and other. No one is saying nothing about CNN firing Mark over the topic of Israel. When it comes to Israel, you can criticize everything, everybody, even Jesus Christ. But you can't criticize Israel. I don't understand that. In, 20, in the 21st century, I don't understand it. Well, actually, I would, I would contend that you do. You do understand it. You understand it very well. So take an, the opportunity to tell us what you understand. In this situation, what is it that you understand better than 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 you say? You trace. I don't. I can't. I, I really can't. I don't know if I'm upset, too upset. I'm more upset now than when I called you. I, I mean, I just. It, I want to know why are our people so powerless? That that I mean, it it really bothers me. Everybody would be on the bandwagon. If it was somebody else other than Israel, I I, I look. What, I look what the, is in your mind? I I just want you to frame the question. Even if you don't answer it, I want you to frame the question that we should focus on and answer. What is okay. that question? Why is everybody afraid of Israel, especially black folks, to afraid of the European Jews? Okay, that's a question. Now, I, I know they have money, and I know they know how to use the power and influence that they have. I know that. But there comes a time when you have to stop being afraid. I mean, but here's a, there's another complication here, and I'm not trying to defend one person against the other, but there is so much to be considered, and it has to do with a kind of confusion that people have in media as to what their role is. And there is an issue about people not understanding the system that they're in. It should not have been a surprise to uh, uh, Mark that this would likely happen. It should not have been a surprise. And the question is, what is his role? Is he speaking as an individual? Is he speaking as a spokesman? Uh, is he speaking as uh, uh, an analyst? But all of it is totally separate from CNN. Can, whenever he speaks, is it totally 
divorced and separate from his role at CNN. Now, this is what we have to appreciate. You know, uh, what does his contract say that he can and cannot do? Not only because it's, you know, Israel. I'm sure the contract wouldn't say you can't speak about Israel. But when he appears in any open forum in which he's giving an opinion and analysis, does the tag of CNN come along with it? And does he understand that? If he understands that, then he put himself in a precarious position and a vulnerable position because it is hard in some cases to separate what you're saying from what your employer uh, expects you, how the employer expects you to operate. They have their own arrangements. CNN has its arrangements. It agrees to certain things that it's not going to do. It is not going to be critical of Israel. We see that. New York Times, the same thing. So people get a little confused sometimes, not understanding the environment they're in. And so they, they, they slip up and put themselves at risk of this kind of summary treatment. Then they'll argue about First Amendment rights and so forth. It all will come down to a legal question. Is he speaking for himself strictly, uh, or is he rendering an opinion as uh, an employee or contractor with CNN? That obligates him to a certain um, kind of thing that he can do and cannot do. People don't understand that. So, I understand your point. I understand the point that you're making. Uh, because what you're saying is the situation just tears off the, the veneer of especially African Americans having any power at all within themselves, even in an organization. I'll give you an answer, a, a, a story. When I was editor-in-chief of a newspaper, I wrote a story that was very critical, highly critical and controversial about B'nai B'rith. And the story was that based on recently at the time, recently uh, declassified papers, it was shown that B'nai B'rith was part of a spying operation in conjunction with the FBI, spying on black activists. Okay, so I wrote the story, quoted from the papers that I obtained, and the notes from actual memoranda. I got a call. Uh, I got a call from B'nai B'rith saying that the director of B'nai B'rith, Rabbi Foxman, wanted to have a meeting with me. I said, sure, what about? Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm listening to you. Okay. I uh, wanted to have a meeting with me. What was the meeting about? A story with which he seriously disagreed. I said, okay. And then <laughs> the assistant who was making the call made a fatal mistake and said, uh, started telling me the meeting will be held at B'nai B'rith headquarters 
and that's in Manhattan. I said, well, um, my headquarters are in Brooklyn. My office is in Brooklyn. If there is to be a meeting, I'm not going to Mr. Foxman. He's requesting a meeting with me. So he can certainly uh, come to Brooklyn and we'll have our meeting there. Well, that was the first indication that, you know, uh, it, <laughs> it wasn't going to go too well from there. Okay. So I uh, ended up, he did not, I did not have a meeting. I'm not going to, you want a meeting with me and I have to come to you for a meeting? Are you out of your mind? It's not going to happen. So uh, I, I, I didn't get a call back. I just left it the way it was. and. I moved on with my life. We have things to do. Not long after, uh, the publisher came in and uh, with a big grin on his face. And he says, guess where I've been? I have no idea. Where have you been? Well, I just had a meeting with Rabbi Foxman <laughs> at some restaurant or the other. I just had a meeting with Rabbi Foxman, and uh, we'll have to. Uh, he wants some. He wants something done about the story. Uh, what could we do about the story? And I said, I did everything we could do about the story. I did the story. It stays as is. I will not be part of a retraction or correction or anything like that. If he wishes to write an opinion piece, uh, you know, taking apart the article, he's free to do that. If we have space, we'll run it. But uh, I'm not here to take instructions uh, from Rabbi Foxman about how I should write a story that is so plain and so clear. There's only one angle. Did B'nai B'rith cooperate with the FBI in planting people? I presume I had no proof that these would be both blacks and whites, liberal whites, implanting themselves in what was considered at the time a burgeoning radical movement. It wasn't a radical movement. These people were uh, reacting to uh, stories and situations in New York City and, and sending this material over to the FBI with the aim of uh, spying, keeping a track of what was going on in the black community. That's the story. That's the end of, the, that's the end of that. There's no change in my view to, to that. So I'm not going to sit and be lectured by anybody to tell me how wrong I was to quote declassified material as, a, as a, a source. You can't get more authoritative than that. That's what the FBI had. So that was my position. But I'm telling you the story because I was undermined by the publisher. None other than the publisher. But still, he did not get his way. The story stayed as, as it was. And I was not going to submit myself under any circumstances to be uh, instructed on what I needed to do to make the ADL look better. You're crazy. I'm not going to do it. That's not my job. I did my job. And it would stand up in any court of law. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that people need to appreciate, the environment in which you're working. And I'm sure that, you know, we'll come to learn what happened there with uh, Mr. Hall. What happened? And why was he so summarily pilloried and deprived of his rights, and whether there is an overarching argument here that binds him from certain things that he, he can and cannot do, 
when he is, you know, speaking in public uh, according to the the rules of a contract or the terms of a contract, uh, what he is permitted to do or what he is not permitted to do, what he, how he is to represent himself, is he was he clear that this was a situation in which uh, he was free to speak as himself? Was he supposed to get clearance in uh, 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 appearing in public on any matter? And in this instance, did not. We don't know. We'll see. Uh, you don't think it's over with? Oh, no. No, not at all. This should lead to a major question about the role of people uh, who appear in media uh, or on television and other forms of media as a representative of the media, as a representative of the particular medium, any particular medium. They are bound, as I understand it, uh, by all kinds of contracts about what they can and can't say, where they can and can't go, what clearances they need to have. Uh, there are some organizations that basically enslave you <laughs> by contract. And people, and, and that would be surprising because, among other things, he's a lawyer. So uh, we have to see what happened there. But in any event, we should react because to us, this is a First Amendment issue. Why can't he express his opinion? And is this a situation in which uh, outside forces compelled CNN and elements within CNN to make an example of him in terms of criticizing Israel? Uh, is it now the expectation that the rules that apply in Israel, which mean that you're not supposed to criticize the government and get away with it, some kind of action would be taken against you? Is this a, a situation where that mentality is being applied here? We need to know. It's not over. Not over at all. I understand your point of view because you are landing right in the war zone uh, of debate. Why is it that we should assume that it is okay to uh, exert this kind of pressure on an African-American person or a person who uh, ideologically differs with what is seen to be the standard thinking in the newsrooms of America. You can't, you absolutely cannot criticize Israel. I did it all the time. Because the issues that we dealt with involve having to look deeper at policies. I've done it right here on this program, looking at policies in Israel. And you know, you can be sure, because there is a, 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 a cadre of people whose job it is to monitor who's saying what. And if they decide arbitrarily that you've crossed the line and you criticize Israel, <laughs> I mean, really, you think that we should give them the, the right to do that? No. But we first have to understand the elements of this thing as best we can. Where is the, the loophole here, if there is one, that allowed them to do this? But in any event, we should express dismay that they so blatantly decided to violate what we normally consider to be the First Amendment rights of anyone to criticize Israel. He was not being demonic about it. He was talking about something that uh, we've talked about here in the United States a lot, 
that everybody should have equal rights. But it now takes in another element with which we ought to be very uncomfortable, which is an African-American man who has degrees up the eyeballs, who is in a position to comment. He's not operating outside of his academic authority. He has to now answer to somebody. He has to go before somebody and uh, lay out chapter and verse about what he's going to say. Really? Is that what you're going to, is that what is the expectation? Is that why he's being punished? That he breached the ramparts? He had no right whatsoever to involve himself in a conversation that is quite pertinent, quite uh, uh, normal, I think, to engage in this discussion. So we have several levels at which we have to, you know, figure out how we are going to react. But that brings us to the end of our program today. Thank you so much for contributing that. And uh, it is the weekend. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, Surround yourselves with people who bring positive dimension to your life. And we'll see each other Monday. Bye-bye.